Good day and shalom. I am Teresita Calvenda Bagarinao, a licensed professional teacher, and together with Ms. Patricia Lourdes Morales, we were invited by Dr. Jover Pantau to share with you about social emotional learning in the context of your course, Fundamentals of Peace Education 101. Allow me to share my screen with you as I proceed with my presentation. Assessing social, emotional, and behavioral outcomes in the context of Fundamentals of Peace Education 101 subject. This is the overview of my presentation. I will be sharing with you about the following. First, about what social, emotional, or affective part of learning is. In particular, I'll be sharing with you how important it is in the context of this course. Next, I'll also be sharing about the general background and nature of your students, of our, our college students taking Fundamentals of Peace Education 101. We need to look at this because we need to see how fitting are our assessment tasks with the nature of our students. And lastly, I'll be sharing how we can measure the social, emotional, and behavioral learning outcomes for the subject fundamentals of, fundamental of Peace Education 101. Let's go to the first part. What is the effective, effective domain in learning? This effective domain is one of the components of the three domains explicitly expressed in the taxonomy of learning objectives of Bloom. So we have the cognitive, the affective, and the psychosocial or the psychomotor domain. The affective domain is also called as the socio-emotional domain, and they refer or these refer to the awareness and growth in attitudes, emotions, and feelings. It involves one's emotional response. And if we really want to affect change, especially in the overall goal of this particular course, it is very essential. And I'll be discussing with you in the next few minutes how essential is this component. The affective domain is complementary with the cognitive domain. And it should result in a change in behavior. They are not independent with one another. It cannot just be cognitive domain, cannot just be psychomotor domain, it cannot just be affective domain. They need to all be intertwined. The Bloom's taxonomy of objectives suggests that as educators, we don't only focus on one domain, but put equal emphasis on the other domains as well. The affective domain refers to the process of exploring and adopting human interests, attitudes, values, and appreciation. And the great challenge in this part is that it cannot just be measured by the traditional means like the paper and pencil quiz or the paper and pencil test. And rather relies heavily on self-reflection. Because after all, how are we going to measure attitudes, emotions, and feelings? The recent decades saw the rise in studies emphasizing the importance of social emotional learning, emotional intelligence, addressing the need for addressing the whole child or the whole learner. And experts have seen the importance of soft skills, not only of the technical or hard skills. Experts have seen the importance of mindsets, skills, and attitudes in helping a person succeed and in having a well-balanced life. It goes the same with peace education and global citizenship. We cannot just deal with concepts, with theories, with definitions. If we need to affect change, especially when the students step out of the university and start their professional careers, then we need to address what drives or influences their behavior. And a very big part of this includes their emotions, their level of emotional intelligence. Meaning, we need to put emphasis on the social-emotional or in the affective domain in everything that we teach. 
especially for this particular subject. Specifically, let's talk for the next minute. What are the roles of our emotions this, since this is at the center of what we are going to talk about? According to Kendra Cherry in her study in 2016, emotions can motivate people to take action. They are very powerful. We are aware of that, right? We know how feelings and emotions can propel us to take action or to not take any action at all. Next, emotions can also help people survive, thrive, and adapt. For example, the emotion of fear. The, the emotion of fear is neither negative nor positive. If we're going to use fear in its right context, then it can help us survive and thrive and avoid danger. But it can, if it will hinder us in taking the necessary action step or decision to make our lives better, then it's not a good one. In the context of this particular subject, being aware of our emotions, for example, the emotion of pain or fear, they can help people adapt to the needed changes when we adapt the culture of peace. Another role of our emotions is that it can help us make decisions. Logical thinking is not the only factor that influences us when we need to take decision on what course of action to take. Emotions influence that aspect great. And another role of emotions is that it can help us understand one another. For example, empathy if a person can relate to another person's feelings or emotions then they can greatly understand one another and it's very important in the context of this education as i've mentioned earlier the affective domain is one of the three domains in the levels of tax levels of taxonomy of bloom and in this particular domain, there are five levels in increasing order. Receiving, responding, valuing, organization, and characterization. I will discuss this more in details in the next few minutes. But the challenge here is this. There is no denying about the importance of this particular domain. But educators or teachers are being challenged on how they can evaluate or measure the learning outcomes in this area. We know how important assessment is in every teaching learning experience. But the question is, how are we going to measure emotions? How are we going to measure soft skills? How are we going to measure mindset? And that is the big challenge in store for us and before we talk about that let's go to one factor very important factor then can that can bridge the link in helping us make effective assessment tasks and that is understanding the nature of our students our college students are most belonging in the age group of 18 to 22 so they are in the late adolescence to early adulthood and in this particular stage our students can be said to have developed already a strong sense of self and identity supposedly they are past the role confusion stage they are also in the stage where they plan to actualize their own abilities. They are now more focused on their career, especially because they are taking their particular degrees or courses. They are also more focused on forming intimate or loving relationships with a group of people or with another person or with an organization. And for those who are in their early adulthood already, most of them are already learning commitment to work or commitment with another person. And it is at this stage 
wherein they have a pronounced or great sense of idealism, which is very ideal in the context of this particular subject. Cognitively, they also have greater capabilities to express their ideas. And most of them, especially if they are already in their early adulthood, in their early 20s, most of them are supposed to have already acquired their own identity, their own sense of identity, value system, and a set of moral principles. So this is the general nature, but I am pretty sure that you know your particular students very well, especially your specific group of students in your specific college. Now, what about the nature of this particular generation or the Generation Z? Let's take a look at this infograph presented by Macringle, a research group based in Australia. Even though they're based in Australia, we can still get a lot of common characteristics to the Filipino members of Generation Z. If I am not mistaken, most of the professors of teachers of our present college students belong to Generation X. Maybe some to the baby boomers generation or in the Generation Y or the millennial generation. So you can see on this part, if the teacher belongs to Generation X, these are the characteristics, while these are the characteristics of the students, Generation Z, those who were born between 1995 to 2010. So please take a look at the infograph. Take note as well of the leadership change from Generation X to Generation Z. The present generation is more on collaboration and contribution. All right, let's go to another infographic about this generation. I know it's very tempting to look first at the generation where we belong before to the generation Z, which we are talking about. And it's perfectly normal. And I think it's also good to take note of our the characteristics of our own generation as we compare it with the generation of our students so that we will be more aware of the differences and work on how we can gap or bridge the gap, rather, of those differences. All right, let's go to the leadership style. For our college students belonging to Generation Z, most of them belong to Generation Z, they work best with the empowering kind of leadership. So take a look at the diagram and how it is presented. For them, their ideal leader is a collaborator working with them. And look at their learning style. They are multimodal. If the teacher or the professor belongs to Generation S, most likely the learning style of the professor is the, on the participative side. But for our Generation Z, they are multimodal, meaning they can learn through different means. And they are easily influenced by forums, but what they can hear or get advice from other people, even if they are not their peers. And they are, of course, very digital. All right. They are also more into Spotify. So I'm taking note of these things because you might want to consider them later when we talk about the assessment tasks. So 
This is just a review, an overview as well of the nature of our college students taking this particular course. Now let's go to the third part of my presentation. How then are we going to assess the effective domain of the fundamentals of Peace Education 101 given the following factors? Number one, that this is a very important domain. We cannot just focus on the cognitive side, on the definitions, theories, and principles. Another given is that we now know or we have refreshed ourselves with the nature of our students. And the third factor that we are going to consider is the context and overall goals of this course, which are stated in your syllabus. How are we going to measure then? Number one, the first step is to first know what affective or what social emotional skills, mindsets, and behavior matter the most. What are those skills, mindsets, and behavior will the students need in order to meet the overall goal of the course? For other subjects, this is what we call the macro skills. So what big skills or macro skills do they need to have in order to meet the overall goal of FPE 101? So we need to establish them first. So let's go back to the five levels of the effective domain. And you might want to reflect on what you have mapped out as your learning outcomes. So the five levels of the effective domain are receiving, responding, valuing, organization, and characterization. So what do we mean by the lowest level in this domain, receiving? It refers to the awareness of the need and the willingness to hear selected attention. This is the first level because this is where the students start to be receptive or open to learning about peace education. The key words for this, um, for this particular level include acknowledge, ask, attentive, courteous, dutiful, follows, gives, listens, and understands. Take note that these are not the verbs or the action words for the objectives, all right? But rather, these are keywords that when students present these keywords in the written feedback, in their reflections, at the meaning of the sentence conforms to the concept of this level, it means that they are already achieving this first level of the effective domain. After receiving is the responding. So meaning they are already open to learning, for example, about this education or learning about being open with the different religions. Now, the next level is how are they responding to what they have listened from the lesson? Now, this refers to actively participating in learning. Like for example, actively participating in class discussions or in your discussion forum if it's in the online mode. It also includes responding to various appearances. Learning outcomes may emphasize compliance in response, willingness to respond, or satisfaction or motivation in response. So we will have a clue or we'll, or we'll know that the students are already developing this second level if they are responding willingly to the activities of the activities, formative activities of the course. So the keywords here are answers, assistance, assist, compliance, discussions, greetings, help, tags, shows, gifts, and 
narration. Next level, and I believe this is this is where most of your learning outcomes are are headed to. You want to have at least in you have you want to be the students to be at least in this third level in the affective domain in the valuing. It is defined as the ability to judge the worth or value of something. That's why most of your learning outcomes are in the reflect. There is a word reflect and, and share. It also refers to the ability to express it clearly from simple acceptance to a more complex state of commitment. So when a learner internalizes a particular set of values, these value beliefs can usually be expressed by explicit and identifiable behaviors. So examples include expressing convictions, which are very, which is evident in your learning outcomes about, a, for example, a democratic process or being sensitive to individual and cultural differences focusing, for example, in on diversity, addressing value conflicts, proposing social improvements, social improvement plans, and fulfilling commitments and informing management of concerns. So I believe the learning outcomes that you have mapped out are already in this, are already aiming for this at this third level of effective, in the effective domain. So the key words are appreciates, cherish, treasure, demonstrates, initiates, invites, joins, justifies, proposes, respect, and share. Next level, uh, one step higher in the level in the effective domain, organization. It is defined as comparing and classifying values, resolving conflicts between them, and creating a unique value system with a primary focus on comparison, relevance, and integrated values. Case in point rec includes recognizing the need for an equilibrium between freedom and responsibility, explaining the importance of a system. So this is where the student already sees the big picture that's why the key words here include compares relates and synthesizes and this can be seen in their reflections and the highest level is the characterization it is defined as establishment of a value system that controls learner behavior which is universal, consistent, predictable, and the most important feature of learners. Keywords here include acts, discriminates, displays, influences, modifies, performs, qualifies, questions, devices, serves, solves, and verifies. So this is the aim, the highest aim of the effective domain and can be usually seen when they are already in the real world. That's why I personally believe that in the learning outcomes that you have mapped out, yes, it's all right that most of them fall in the levels of valuing and organization. Next, after you have gathered or established what particular social emotional skills, mindset, and behavior matter the most or what are those that will help you meet the overall goal of the course? We now go and gather the baseline and compare the results after each module. You see, unlike in the cognitive domain and in the psychosocial domain, we cannot use the traditional assessment task that we that we give, or we cannot just use, for example, the paper and pencil quiz. So for the effective domain, usually these are the three, the three modes that we use: teacher observation, 
students self report and peer ratings but since we are in this uh, we are in this situation whether you are using printed modules or online distance learning the the most effective one that we can use in our particular context today is the student self report so if you're familiar with the self survey rating that teachers usually give before the before the lesson and after the lesson we are referring to that like for example in the lesson of understanding the value and culture of peace before the module or before the lesson the student may rate himself or herself from a scale of one to five how he or she understands the concept of peace and then right after the module right after the lesson he or she will also rate himself or herself how he or she progressed from her rating before to her rating after the class like maybe it's just level two about her understanding of the culture of peace before the lesson and then after the lesson maybe her his or her understanding is already in level four or level five same way the other lessons on conflict management on being open to the different diversity of religions or being um active listeners there it would be great if the student can rate himself or herself before and after that would be your baseline and you can compare the results after each module since the ultimate evidence of success of social emotional learning outcomes are the success of the behavioral outcomes we can only rely on the self-assessments and personal reflections of the learner himself or herself in the process and aside from the rating scales personal rating scales that i have mentioned there are also various means on how the students can show their reflections or the effective learning outcomes the most common is the reflection paper or the the reaction paper or insight paper you know the traditional essay essay question that we give but there are a lot more especially in the context of distance learning and especially with the nature of the students that we have audio recordings for example podcast type is one especially if we will go back to the nature of their the nature of these learners spotify is very common among their generation so you may want to utilize that instead of just asking them to write down why not ask them to record their reflections podcast type like in spotify another another option is video recording or the vlog type especially for the extroverted ones a poster a poem an infographic a social media poster can also be other means the important thing here is their reflection their mindset their self-awareness are evidently being manifested through the reflections the the means can differ the students may choose remember they are multimodal learners they may choose give them the freedom to choose but there should be there should be a baseline or a minimum of what you are trying to measure there should be a clear question for example to be answered and an established this is an 
important one, an established criteria on what you are trying to assess or measure. I know in the other video of Ms. Morales, she has touched on the rubrics and on the grasps type or in the rough type. So the standards there or the rubric is very important. And we can also use that in assessing their reflection. So whether the mode differs, whether it's a podcast type or a vlog type, a reflection paper, an infographic, that means that means that don't matter. What matters most is that the student is able to show his or her reflection of what you are trying to measure in the affective domain. But again, the challenge remains. How can you measure sincerity? How can you measure the honesty of their answers? The clarity and organizations of thought, organization of thoughts, for example, can be part of the rubric and the teacher can, can rate them or can assess them. Same with the relevance and meaningfulness of the answer. The teacher can also rate them in the rubric. But what about honesty and sincerity of the student's answers? We can only see the commitment of the student to the overall goal of the course once he or she steps out of the university and applies what he or she has learned from this particular course, especially when he or she is already practicing her profession. So we can only do so much, but for the purpose of assessing their progress as they in the affective domain as they are taking this particular course it's not impossible to rate them we can still measure their progress on their mindset on their skills on the soft skills and on their emotions but we also need to trust their self-assessment and their rating we also need to believe on our students but please take note, it would be very difficult for the students if we are not going to integrate our assessment tasks addressing the cognitive, affective, and psychosocial domain in, in authentic assessment. If we're going to have separate tasks for each domain, remember we are talking of the same set of students here the students may feel very tired with the assessment task of this particular subject the best way to measure what they have learned is to create a performance task that will align these three domains make them perform or produce something that will show what they have learned addressing the cognitive domain that will show what they can do addressing the psychosocial domain and addressing as well or showing as well what they feel or their reflection on the importance or in the significance on the meaning of this particular lesson or module. The key here is to align, align, align what they have what they have acquired, align what they, what meaning they have made from the lesson and make sure that they can transfer them to what they can perform or produce. So I believe, personally believe, that would be the best means on how we can measure what they have really felt about that the lesson or the module in this education. It should be seen on the behavior, not only through their reflections, but their reflections should be evident on their behavior or the actions that they will take. So align them, align them, cognitive, affective, and the 
psychosocial problems. Now, once we have the self-report ratings, we now have the, the data from the rubrics, then we can now analyze the results and we can compare from each batch of students that we have which strategies, for example, have helped them meet the learning outcomes. And then we can take the necessary actions and adjustments if needed. Remember, it's not the experience that is the best teacher, but evaluate that experience is. So we also need to analyze the results of their assessments so that we can adjust what needs to be adjusted so we can again the end goal is to meet the overall goal of the course thank you so much for giving me the chance to share this with you